So our final talk today um, is again, Dr. Professor, uh, Associate Professor Michael Back, who's a radiation oncologist at uh, the Northern Sydney Cancer Centre and Genesis Care, and also the director of the Brain Cancer Group. Uh, and Dr. Back is gonna talk about um, a topic that I think is really important and something that, you know, really amongst all the treatment that you've had is around how you continue living life after diagnosis. So Dr. Back's gonna talk about dealing with the uncertainty, outcome and survivor, survivorship issues. Thanks, Dr. Back. So thanks, Marina. And uh, I promise in this uh, presentation, I've limited to one MRI picture. So when we see our patients in the clinic, and we're seeing someone who's been diagnosed with oligodendroglioma and they're coming for a consultation. They're at the age of 25. Um, we, we see an oligodendroglioma as being a very optimistic thing because we're dealing with glioblastoma and very negative prognosis most of the time. But we've still got to realize that if we're saying, well, wow, there's a great chance that you'll be alive in 10 years' time, it only takes that 25 year old to 35. So there is a lot of you know, uncertainty that happens along that pathway. Uh, hopefully in this sort of session, I can give an idea of what's happening more recently. And I, I guess there's some aspects of hope to say that we're getting better survival going beyond that sort of 10, 15 years in the modern era as, we, as we're coming through. And thus we need to be concentrating on issues which are related to not only survival, but also survivorship, which is the way people live alongside of their illness. So what is survivorship? Well, survivorship is, can be defined as a process for living well and beyond a cancer diagnosis. And there's an increasing emphasis on health and well-being rather than only the absence of disease or illness. So that's the concept of survivorship in a nutshell. Now from there, we can develop survivorship models. And here's a great model of survivorship that we all follow. Well, we can't, it's too complicated. And, but what it shows is there's multiple factors that go into survivorship. And the survivorship models that have been developed for say cancers like breast cancer or cancers like bowel cancer, where there is high rates of cure and absence of disease progression and unlikelihood for disease progression in the years gone by. Those issues are very much different to what our patients with gliomas have to deal with in a survivorship model. So survivorship needs to be looked at in a different way in glioma compared to the usual survivorship models that happen in the community. Now, these are great. These are the templates in which we can start, but we need to develop more. Here's a, a more basic model, which I think is pretty good for just understanding the issues that happen uh, alongside of uh, one of our patients with a glioma. And so survivorship in the long-term care of the patient means managing things like complications, uh, issues related to neurological deficits and physical function, uh, other health issues which might come up in, intercurrently, um, social interactions, mental health, really important uh, in terms of managing the uncertainty and also potential uh, loss of revenue because of the impact of the illness, uh, loss of employment uh, and supports down that pathway. Relationships and most importantly within this pathway is also the caregiver who's a key person in our patients diagnosed with glioma. Intermixed with that uh, survivorship and that sort of model is also assessing what we call unmet needs. Now, sometimes unmet needs are unmeetable needs, so we can't provide an answer or can't provide a solution, but there are many needs which are unmet, which we could meet if we had better models of understanding survivorship. Here's an example from the UK, and these were patients with um, long-term follow-up in glioma, and the three top unmet needs were issues related to memory and concentration, fatigue, and recognizing signs of progression. So that uncertainty, how do I pick up if the tumor is coming back? And the need for support is also seen there in the same sort of features as well. So unmet needs in the survivorship model is also intimately linked as we see in our future research. So where do we stand with oligodendroglioma in terms of survival or survivorship? So let's look at this survival issue because I saw a lot of the questions were coming through about 
survival? What's the rates of survival, etc.? And I think it's important to reflect upon it. Everyone's individual, so the, the answers that we give are based upon population data, but every person's journey along that population is an individual journey. But let's get an understanding what a survival curve is. And we use these a lot in medicine. And survival curves are basically uh, the rate of survival here on this um, uh, y-axis. So 100% survival going down to 0% survival and the years after diagnosis. And this is the curve of which happens with the population. And the little clicks are where people are up to in their follow-up and the steps are when people have actually died from their disease. So what we're finding is our patients with oligo, and this is our a survival curve ours from RDH mutated tumors in general, is that we're getting good levels of survival going out eight or, eight or years plus down the track, but we don't have a lot of data going beyond that. Here's some long-term data from the US uh, National Surveillance Registry. Now, the, the surveillance registry has got some flaws with it, but it, it's actually quite a good data set to sort of learn from. And this is patients with oligodendroglioma who uh, they looked at death related to the tumor over time based upon age. And so they've got survival in months here. So you're looking about 10 years, falling around this sort of 60% figure here for various ages uh, and lower for older age groups. Now, it's important to recognize this, um, that this data is actually data from 2000 to 218. It's good numbers, but a lot of things have changed in that time period. And I use a pretty rough analogy sometimes, it's like the iPhone. So you wouldn't make a phone call now with an iPhone first generation. You could, you could still probably make the phone call, but you could do things a hell of a lot better, a hell of a lot more efficiently, and have better results if you're using a later generation. Same things with improvements in time and this sort of technology is also improved in technology when we look at brain scans. And so this is an MRI back in 2012, and this is the same patient's MRI scan in 2020. It's the same patient, it's the same M MRI provider, it's just better software and better equipment on the machine means we can see a lot more detail in the brain compared to what we could in the past. And as a result, we can manage people better if we can see more things. So if a surgeon can see more things day one, they can make an appropriate decision regarding surgery. If a radiation oncologist can see things more day one, then we can make a much more appropriate uh, decision in regarding the design of treatment. So there's been improvements over time. And what we're seeing is if you look at data sets, say from this USC database, where we're looking at patients from 2000 onwards, then if we look at more modern data in shorter subsets, we're seeing these curves lift up. So these curves will lift up and they will get better survival at later times. And we're seeing this from those clinical trials that uh, Dr. Lee showed before, the results seen in those trials compared to our current data sets, our current data sets are a lot better. Now this is unpublished data, but data from our own patients who have been managed with newly diagnosed grade three or anaplastic oligodendroglymas. These are patients that we see upfront and we deliver treatment. And this is our North Shore data over with a good subset of patients. And our overall survival at that sort of um, 12 year mark is in the order of 85 to 90%. So that suggests that at you know going down in the future, we're seeing about 10 to 10%, 15% of people dying within 10 years after diagnosis, but the majority of patients are alive and greater than 80 to 85% are alive 10 years plus down the track. And that should convert to better 15 year survivals and hopefully better 20 year survivals. It's very hard to judge 20 year survivals because you need 20 years of good MRIs and we don't have that. We actually didn't have MRI, I wasn't allowed to prescribe an order an MRI to an outpatient when I started as a specialist in 96. So it's only in recent times that we've actually had really good access to MRIs and really good access to really good quality MRIs. The other thing about these survival curves, that's the overall survival of our patients. There's also relapse-free survival, once again, our data here. So in that first 10 years, we're seeing more 
a, a number of patients who have relapsed, but they're still alive. So we're also seeing patients who at 10 years, a majority of patients have not relapsed or are projected not to relapse based upon these survival curves. These survival curves are not published at the moment because we need more time for them to mature to be relevant. But the data is tracking well to suggest that in patients managed from 2008, 2010, 2012, 2016, we're seeing better survivals. And we're seeing that in our patients with glioblastoma as well. So we've looked at our own data and patients treated before 2013 versus patients treated uh, after 2013. The patients after 2013 are doing better in terms of survival, even though it's the same recipe in terms of radiotherapy and chemotherapy, because a whole lot of other factors support um, imaging, uh, the way we deliver the actual treatment has all improved. So we're actually getting better outcomes. So thus the future emphasis should be more on survivorship rather than the actual survival, because we've got to make sure that we're looking after our patients. So here is a very brief 10 research lessons on survivorship in patients with oligodendrogliomas or favorable subtype brain tumors. This is mixed with a bit of dogma as well. So I uh, apologize for that, but there is limited data coming through, but the data coming through is very interesting. So we've published our own patient uh, cohort of patients with RDH mutated tumors or favorable subtype tumors, which include the oligodendrogliomas, and looking at patients who are five years plus down the track after initial diagnosis. And what we found is that survivors have good function, but there may be some deficits and impact. So if we look at our patients five years down the track, we're seeing that the patients have what we call ECOG zero or one performance status in more than 90 odd percent of patients. So they're managing well, they're functioning well. We're also seeing that patients returning to employment after completion of radiotherapy for these favorable subtype tumors in the patients that, who have got the follow-up beyond five years, we're seeing high levels of patients returning back to work. But if we go back to the start, we're seeing before the radiotherapy, a whole lot of patients who are impaired at baseline who couldn't work because of the nature of the tumor or the nature of the uh, effect of um, the subsequent initial treatments that were required. This is really good data from University of um, Melbourne with Kate Drummond's team down in Melbourne who are projecting patients and doing follow-up of patients who have had initial um, uh, operation for a favorable risk glioma. And they're, they're finding also that uh, patients can have good function, but there are deficits and impact which happen uh, at time of initial uh, diagnosis. So their curves here show uh, a rate of quality of life for various domains um, and various scores with the gray being the normal population and the um, black areas being the low grade glioma population. So we're seeing that uh, groups of, of patients with low grade gliomas have got lower quality of life in various domains uh, compared to a normal population in the community. So it's important to recognize there are deficits, even though our patients do have relatively good function. This is interesting data that's not published yet, but presented. And this was presented last year. And this is from uh, the Dutch who have done a lot of good work in um, um, uh, quality of life and neurocognitive function after glioma treatment. And uh, they've published on following up their patients with low-grade glioma 26 years after diagnosis. So firstly, one, we've got patients alive 26 years down the track, which is fantastic. And they're actually looking at those patients and doing audits on those patients over time and looking at their health-related quality of life. And what they're saying is that the patients actually maintain their function pretty well over time. So if you get through the initial insult, okay, then your general quality of life is maintained down the track, even at time periods 26 years after initial diagnosis. Next research lesson is relapse of tumor is obviously bad. Now we, we don't need, we just look at that one MRI and we can see the, the full extent of infiltration in the brain and that's obviously gonna have an impact on the patient. So relapse of tumor is obviously bad. So therefore we have to make our judgments as well as to the, when we time in for treatments. So even though a treatment might have some morbidity, we don't want to let that more, the tumor progression through delaying it lead to greater impact. 
So it's that initial uh, decision making around observation and when to intervene becomes really important. Also, multiple craniotomies is also probably bad. Now, this data is not strong. Our data was suggesting that as well. The patients who have had multiple craniotomies, and by default, that generally means multiple relapses before they come and have treatment, have potential issues with quality of life or other neurological deficits. That's controversial at the moment, but there is data coming through. This data here is actually from the UK, and it's actually in meningioma patients. Our data in, uh, in gliomas has also been published, and that did suggest multiple craniotomies did have an adverse effect on some of the functional issues returning back to work, et cetera. But it probably correlates with um, uh, relapse of tumor, not just a surgical procedure. Lesson number five is that seizure medications need to be optimized. So we think about late side effects from the radiotherapy and the chemo, but the anticonvulsant medications also potentially have an impact. And they can have other effects on the body and other effects in, the, in terms of uh, patient functioning. And sometimes cognitive issues, et cetera, may need to be addressed. And sometimes it involves a need to rotate the anticonvulsant medication. Some patients need to stay on anti-seizure medication, but other patients can, may need to actually have their medications uh, optimized and maybe rotated to try to minimize the effects that might be evident from uh, one drug over another. That's a very difficult and very specialized area as well. Next research lesson, what we're learning is that radiation therapy design is probably more important than the machine. So this is an example of a patient treated elsewhere and a patient treated by, uh, by myself in a sort of a sophisticated uh, brain tumor practice. Now, rather than use using basic field arrangements and design of treatment, um, we use multiple beams to try to minimize the dose to the normal brain. So the machine is actually the same. It's the same machine, it's got the same hardware on it, it's got the same software on it, but we can utilize the design of treatment on that machine optimally if we've got a good pathway set up. So there's a question I think about proton therapy. Proton therapy is a, a good machine and there's gonna be a proton therapy machine in Australia in the next couple of years, which would be great down in Adelaide. However, it's not so much the machine that's important, it's how the treatment's designed on it. And most of the machines now mimic some of the uh, dose characteristics that protons can give. And in fact, in the, U in the Europe, there's various centers who won't treat their glioma patients on protons because it's actually not favorable to actually deliver treatment in that way for a brain tumor where you need a graduated dose rather than a very sharp area of the dose. It's, it's a technical issue, but it's actually not the machine that's important. It's actually how it's designed, which is, is bringing out more information. And we see that in some data coming through now. And this is a data from, um, from India actually, where they looked at young patients with low grade brain tumors and they looked at patients who were treated in a standard manner versus treated in a sophisticated manner. And they saw better um, quality of life and cognitive endpoints at five years plus down the track for more sophisticated treatment. But there's not a lot of data on that to quote. Research level lesson number seven is that we've got to accept the quality of life at three months after radiotherapy will be lower, but then it improves. And this is data from a low grade glioma study that we were involved with on, at North Shore, it's a European study. And they looked at the quality of life points after radiotherapy. And in the three months afterwards, people had more fatigue, et cetera, but it came back to where they were at baseline. So there is an improvement over time. Now, big issue here is fatigue and depression are intimately linked. And they, may, they appear to be important symptoms. So in that a uh, Dutch study looking at 26 years down the track of follow-up on patients, fatigue and depression were the two big ones they looked at. And fatigue, depression, and cognitive function are intimately linked. So if you're tired, your cognitive function's off. If you're not managing well with your tiredness, that might lead to depressive symptoms. So they're all interrelated. And patients who come into the clinic with uh, excessive fatigue, you've got to think about uh, cognitive function, and you also got to think about depression. So in survivorship, you have to look at all these factors merging together. And this is also data which we're seeing in Kate Drummond's University of Melbourne study as well, is that, that cognitive changes, um, they're influenced by multiple factors, but mostly the initial site and extent of the tumor. So 
what their study shows that those, this is curves of patients who have had uh, normal population. Um, they put a point where there was uh, potential clinical uh, relevance if, you lower, if your cognitive function is lower than that point. And they found in their groups of patients that there was a lower cognitive function in their patients in follow-up, but it was all based around where they started off. So if we can get through and support people to that initial part, then and minimize the effects of the diagnosis, effects of the operation, effects of uh, immediate treatment and seizure medications, et cetera, we can potentially stabilize people's cognitive function, hopefully improve it or start them off at a better time point. But sometimes the tumor is there that's caused the issues and therefore the cognitive function is hard to reverse over time. The other aspect is, the, is behavioral change, including exercise and mindfulness meditation practice may have an impact on well-being and that's cognition and lethargy. So if you think that cognition, lethargy and depression are all merged into one, then wellness practices and getting people in a survivorship program to be concentrating on wellness, which might be exercise or meditation, that may impact on uh, lethargy, which might impact on cognition and might Im impact on depression. So all these things are intimately linked, but we need more evidence. So we need more evidence and the best way to get around that is to design a structured approach to survivorship. We need a structured approach. We need to look at assessing patients' unmet needs, and then we need to develop a wellness plan. And this is the basic model that comes out from uh, the oncological societies in Australia for all sorts of um, uh, cancer subgroups. And then the most important feature of their plan is self-management, where the patient is the person driving their um, survivorship model. Now that may be okay with breast cancer, but not in our patients who might have some cognitive issues. So for brain tumors, we actually need a different approach. We just can't rely on the basic survivorship models which have been developed and some basic survivorship patterns. Because self-management, if you've got cognitive issues, if you've got other issues, may be difficult to drive. So we need to get a reboot in the model. So let's look at the Australian programs that are available for survivorship. And unfortunately, the screen is blank because we actually don't have any apart from some small institution programs. We don't have a coordinated approach to survivorship in Australia for our patients with oligodendroglioma or fabular risk brain tumors. There's an absence of programs. We don't have any structured development. So instead of Australian programs, we've got to look at Australian research. And this is where we need people associated with VTA to be really actively involved. So the University of Sydney got a, has got a Big Cancer Australia grant called the BRAINS program, which is looking at brain cancer, rehabilitation, assessment, and innovation for, for survivorship needs. Now, the first thing is we've got to differentiate patients who have got oligodendroglioma or low-grade tumors, fable subtype tumors versus glioblastoma. They are two completely different illnesses. So we have to look at patients who have got glioblastoma and say brain metastases and look at them differently compared to patients who have got IDH mutated tumors or oligodendrogliomas and meningiomas. And we look at those patients in a different cohort because the two models are completely different. The two needs are completely different. We're talking more emphasis on survival for the bad type tumors, whereas in the oligos, et cetera, we're looking at more long-term survival and survivorship needs. So we really do need to separate the two. And we need BTAA supporters to be right behind this. So if there's surveys being done or research being done, we want people putting their hand up for the BRAINS program. That's a really important one. And it's been running for about 18 months now. So we should be getting some data coming through from the Big Cancer Australia grant. Likewise, we need to look at studies like the University of Melbourne, Kate Drummond's one, which is looking at the quality of life after surgery for low-grade glioma. And the brain cancer group is also doing a functional survivorship audit, but this time at five years after radiotherapy and looking at correlations with MRI changes in our patients that we've managed. So we're looking at those different areas of research and the aim would then be to develop a survivorship program which can run across Australia, not just in Royal Melbourne Hospital or Royal North Shore Hospital, but it can run as an Australian wide thing. The other thing which is important to recognize is that this is not for doctors. It's not for oncologists. We need to be aware of what's going on, but we need this to be driven by our psychologists, our occupational therapists, our physiotherapists, 
our support nurses and nurse practitioners, etc. The doctors are concentrating on different things and unfortunately do neglect different things. But we actually need to get the community health driving in with the general practitioners and driving with community supports to develop these survivorship models. And the BTA is really well situated to be a key driver for that working with these units. So thank you, that's a bit of research and a little bit of dogma, but uh, uh, hopefully that will raise some further discussion. Thank you.